so welcome and thank you for coming today. I'm Nobuo Tsujimura, president of the Asian Big History Association. It's a great joy to cohort such webinar with the International Big History Association. And I appreciate all the people who enabled this. Especially, I greatly appreciate Tan Chi Kyung, our Southeast Asian coordinator, who made great efforts for this. Today, my talk is titled, What Does Big Architecture Mean? I'm not an architect, but today we have three great architects as presenters. So after my talk, you can see all, all of their presentation. But first, as a curtain raiser, I'll talk about more general topic to lay foundation the whole webinar. I heard that some of, some of you are not familiar with big history, but thank you again for coming and joining our webinar. So what is big history? There are several ways to explain it, but today I want to first introduce H.G. Wells. Wells is best known as a scientific novelist, but he is also one of the pioneers of big history. About a century ago, Wells got shocked by the World War I, the greatest war in history at the time. And he wrote it. The need for a common knowledge of the general facts of human history throughout the world has become evident during the tragic happening of the last few years. There can be no common peace and prosperity without common historical ideas. Wells thought that if we see the world only through national histories, stories of nations like Japanese history, Chinese history, or Malaysian history, etc., we cannot prevent war among nations. So he wanted a common history for humanity. That history is what we now call big history. To foster a sense of identity that we are all humans and share one common planet. We need a common story we can share anywhere on the earth. And we big historians believe there are shareable things among us, despite different nations, cultures, and traditions. Today, the people from Malaysia, China, Japan, Netherlands, the United States, and other countries came together here. That fact itself shows we can work together. We can search for something together. But what does our common story look like? Please look at this painting. This is painted by Van Gogh and called Starry Night Over the Rome. And this painting is a good metaphor of big history. Each object drawn in this painting is a symbol of our world and knowledge. We can see stars and cosmos that represents astronomy, the, then another kind of lights also shining. They are electric lights. They are a symbol of modernity, especially science and technology. We can cities, churches, and so on. They represent anthropology and history. Then we can see us, that George, and we can hear sounds of water flows in which life emerged and evolved. And we too, you and me, 
are gazing all of this, pondering our place in the universe. Big history tries to integrate all the knowledge we have known so that we can grasp the whole picture of our universe based on modern science and technology. And by doing so, we become aware of connections of everything. Then let's get back to the title of this webinar. This webinar is titled Big Architecture. Here, big architecture doesn't mean merely large size architecture. Rather, it means rethinking architecture in the light of big history, including very tiny structures to gigantic ones. It also means great construction of sustainable society. It's subtitle of this web. But what does mean rethinking architecture from big history? The big history perspective includes not only human architecture, but also non-human architecture made by other living organisms. Big history also goes beyond us. Big history pays attention not only architecture on Earth, but also architecture in space. So by going beyond humans and us, big history enables fundamental thinking. All architectures have structures, but why are these structures in this universe? Why are there structures in this universe? A key is gravity. In the very beginning of cosmic history, the universe was almost homogeneous everywhere. But there are slightly denser regions where gravity attracted matters slightly denser than other regions. From these regions, the first stars appeared. And stars were a kind of element factory. So within dying stars, new elements were forged. And these elements shaped our planets and ourselves. About 5,000 years ago, our ancestors learned how to build pyramids against gravity. And in the beginning of the 20th century, Wright brothers succeeded in flying high by an airplane for the first time in human history. And in 1969, we humans first landed on the moon. That's a symbolic moment we went into space by overcoming gravity of the planet. Then we made and maintained space architecture, like the International Space Station. So will humans colonize other planets or galaxies? We don't know an answer now. But what we know now is that space is almost the world of death. In space, there's no air to breathe there are no foods to eat. Instead, it is dark and very, very cold in space. It is about negative 270 degrees Celsius. And there is a high level of radioactivity. So for living in space, we have to bring oxygen and foods from us with protecting our bodies from the cold and radiation. So let's return to the world of life, our familiar planet. We humans began farming about 10,000 years ago. Then some of the human communities shaped agricultural cities from 5,000 years ago or so. A pyramid is a symbol of such civilization. But there's another species that began farming 
much earlier than humans. About eight to 12 million years ago, leaf cutter ants living in the Americas began farming by leaf cutting. Leaf cutter ants cannot eat and digest leaves. Instead, they cultivate fungus by leaves. Please look at top left picture. A leaf cutter ant clips out a leaf by its jaw. Then they bring fragments of leaves to their nest. Next, please look at bottom left picture. In, in that nest, there are gardens to cultivate fungus. Leaf cutter ants chew the fragments of leaves into smaller pieces and mix them with fecal liquid, which become a fertilizer. Then they inserted those fertilizers into the um, substratum or the bottom layer of the fungus gardens. Finally, they eat mycelia of the fungus. This is agriculture, isn't it? In this way, leaf cutter ants mastered farming and built a very big city. Please look at top right picture. These guys poured wicked cement into a nest of leaf cutting ants in Brazil and dug it up for making it visible. The nest reaches as deep as seven to eight meters underground. And the biggest nest includes roughly 8,000 chambers and 8 million inhabitants. Humans achieved such a huge city with 8 million people for the first time in last century, much greater than ants. Lastly, please look at bottom right picture. This is not a picture of parent and child. Both of leaf cutters are adult, but their sizes are greatly different. The smaller ant is a gardener to care the fungus gardens. The biggest ant is a soldier to fight with invaders. So there is a division of labor in their city. In this sense, their city is a kind of agricultural civilization made by ants. Like leaf cutting ants, termites cultivate a fungus too. For that farming, a temperature within a termite mound needs to be maintained about 30 degrees Celsius. For that purpose, termites, termites invented a ventilation system throughout their nests. As the outdoor temperature rises, warm air bends out from the chimney of the mound. Then instead, cooler air enters in. So in this way, termites get fresh air and maintain good temperature for their fungus and living space. The East Gate Center in Zimbabwe imitates that system, uh, their chimney and tunnels, and achieved dramatically decreasing the energy, the energy consumption compared with conventional buildings. Likewise, there will be more and more wisdom and systems we can learn from other living organisms and nature. Big history help us notice and find such wisdom and systems by expanding our sights and interests. So it's time to conclude by going beyond the eyesight confined to humans and to us. Big history enables fundamental thinking. Thanks to that, 
we can similar or earlier forms of what we usually see unique to humans in history of life, us, and the cosmos. This wider perspective gives us fresh insights and hints to rethink and solve our problems, including sustainable architecture. But my today's talk is no more than a tiny clue for that. Tiny clue for rethinking architecture in the light of big history. So we can dig it deeper and deeper. What I want to emphasize is that if we want to shed a new light on what you attracts, uh, new light on what attracts your heart and mind, big history is the one by which you can make it possible. Big history is a field that has much potentials. As of now, it is so-called blue ocean. That is still not so competitive. If you can devote yourself for one or two or three decades, you may become a leading figure in our field. So if you are interested in it, let's do it together. It's fun, joyful, thank you.